Mexico is in custody of a video of a UFO crash retrieval. Let's talk about that and a whole lot more. So it's time for another UFO news roundup. So get in here. This is Jack with Cosmic Crew. And I talk about UFOs and the paranormal. Please hit like and subscribe and let me know what you think in the comments below. Okay, yeah, here we go from Gonzalo Chavez. Mexico Disclosure is in possession of a UFO crash retrieval video. Hopefully it gets released and shown in the third UFO hearing in Mexico. It is a craft from another world. J. Alberto says, I have the vid at your time. It's a ship from another world. And that's all the information we have on it. So, uh, yeah, there is apparently a, a video of a, a UFO crash retrieval, and it may or may not be released in the next uh, UFO hearing in Mexico. Either way, super juicy. It seems like uh, somebody always has a really juicy video, then they tease us with it, and it never seems to materialize. Will this video materialize? Well, we can hope so. Uh, so, fingers crossed. Meanwhile, Ross Coulthard gives us an update on what's going on in Congress with UFOs. From Washington, and I've been talking to people in the Congress, politicians, staffers. I've been talking to insiders in the Pentagon and the intelligence community. It's very, very clear to me that there is a huge level of knowledge in the Congress about this illegal, criminal, program that has been allowed to operate now for many decades. And I think, frankly, it's a test of American democracy. It's completely out of control. What they've been doing is absolutely outrageous. When the public finally get to know what's been going on in their name, they will be disgusted. And they should. They should be asking their congressman and their congresswoman to push hard for oversight of this issue. Because frankly, at the moment, I don't think Congress feels the imperative to push hard on this. There's a cadre of Congress, congressional representatives and senators, a small group who do believe, because they've heard the evidence, they've seen the witness evidence, they've seen the other testimony, the videos, etc., and they are convinced. But they're slightly frustrated because they don't necessarily have the numbers in the House or the Senate to push through key legislation that could frankly just bring this all to a head straight away. What we need is a church style commission where, as happened with the CIA in the 1970s, the crimes that are being committed are finally brought out into the public arena and exposed for all to see. That'd be nice, Ross. That would be super nice. I hope that happens. Of course, that kind of conflicts with the, the Steve Bassett's idea of amnesty uh, and in not calling it a criminal cover-up, but of a truth embargo. Uh, he wants to be a little bit more inclusive to the UFO control group <clears throat> and not alienate them, if you will, uh, by calling it criminal, by, you know, uh, you know, allowing doors to be open that wouldn't be open if we called it criminal. Uh, but Raw says otherwise. He says this is a criminal cover-up and we should have a commission devoted to rooting out uh, the criminality and exposing it for all to see. So what do you think, guys? Which is the better take and the better approach? Uh, what, what will get us toward UFO disclosure uh, faster? Or what's, what's the best take? I, I, I don't know. I go back and forth on that. There is obviously a lot of criminality that needs to be exposed. On the other hand, uh, calling it criminal might not get us to disclosure faster, uh, allowing these guys to come out of the woodworks without fear of reprisals. Eh, might get us there faster. Meanwhile, Kirsten Gillibrand hasn't read the Arrow Report yet. <laughs> I mean, really, not that there's any reason to read the Arrow Report. I almost feel uh, better about her having not read the Arrow Report, but that does kind of seem to signal a lack of interest. I, I don't know. I don't know. But I haven't read it yet. Uh, Kirsten Gillibrand tells, tells Askapol, uh, I read the report on what it said, but I don't have it yet. Uh, I'll read it, she promises. So, yeah, very interesting that she has not read the Arrow Report. Uh, again, I mean, why waste your time on the Arrow Report? Uh, again, I almost feel better about her not having read it. Now, this is an interesting story. It was a, a viewer of the channel actually reached out to me the other day with a theory about who uh, one of these uh, gatekeepers are. 
uh, for the, the UFO information uh, that uh, fit Ross Coulthard's description of who uh, might be on uh, Arrow's secret gatekeeping committee. And uh, but we we both agree that that might be classified information because he had a little birdie had told him something. And, uh, you know, I didn't feel comfortable uh, talking about what may or may not be classified. But Mike Disclosure is putting this out there. So now I feel comfortable talking about it. Sources within the intelligence community have confirmed to me, uh, Mike says, that Stephen J. Hadley checks all of the boxes of a legacy program UAP gatekeeper as described by Ross Coulthard. Ross stated that a member of the National Security Council under Dick Cheney was working with Kirkpatrick, uh, the lovely Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, in an advisory group during his time with Arrow, and that he was also a legacy UAP program gatekeeper. So very interesting, very interesting indeed. And uh, yeah, here are the uh, National Security Council. Uh, one of these people is a legacy UFO program gatekeeper and advisory member to Sean Kirkpatrick, according to Ross Coulthard. Yeah, and so, uh, yeah, so that may be uh, one of the mysterious figures of the UFO control group is this Stephen J. Hadley. Meanwhile, Dana Sheehan gives us an update on Lou Elizondo's book. Yeah. I know Lou Elizondo is the best person to ask this question to, but we did talk about it briefly in January, and I just wanted to see if you have any kind of update on that. Uh, it, it, you, you, I think when we spoke last, you mentioned it would be or should be through the DOPSA process by the end of March. Do you still think that's going to be the case? Do you think it'll still make it through there this month? You're talking about his book. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, it, it, well, that uh, I just talked with him yesterday about it. Uh, he's anticipating that it getting done by the end of this month. Uh, you know, but that's optimistic, uh, perhaps, but he's, uh, he's, he's written the book. He's subjected it to them. Uh, he's, he's taken great pains, uh, to not put anything in the book, uh, that would reveal, uh, any national security information. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you know, that, uh, and, 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 uh, Dobson has been good in the past. They're the ones that cleared the videos. Yeah. I know. So there you go. Uh, it may be optimistic to, to get it cleared this month, Danny Sheehan says, uh, but things are proceeding. In other news, could Gobekli Tepe be the center of ancient Atlantis? This is a new theory uh, that Herman Lewis is talking about. Uh, yeah, this is interesting. Interesting. Uh, the fable tells that Clito had five pairs of twin sons with Poseidon, the eldest of which was Atlas. The ten sons inherited the great city, and the first child, Atlas, became the first ruler of Atlantis. However, it is believed they also built a massive temple for their father with the giant statue of Poseidon riding a chariot carried by winged horses. The statue was utterly built in built in gold and placed in a temple with a spiral roof so high that the clouds drifted through the spirals of the temple. Atlas carrying the maps of the world on his shoulders, the tablets of nations, is Gobekli Tepe, uh, says Herman Lewis. The temple built for Poseidon into the clouds is Mount Numrat. Perfect. The next fact is amazing too. Uh, so yeah, an interesting theory. Here's more on it. A uh, map of Atlantis Kingdom, Island, and City. Putting together the words of Plato and the maps on the tablets of Gobekli Tepe, Atlantis is the Middle East, Anatolia the island, and through the Sicilian gates uh, to ancient Heron, the city. It's larger than Libya and Asia, and together with the continent encompasses their ocean like a clamshell. And there you go, there is the clamshell. And that would be the island of atlantis potentially i don't know intriguing and intriguing that and intriguing that speaking of atlantis potentially is this a, a newly discovered ancient artifact or a 2000 year old artifact this hand this is really interesting uh and it's related to the basque people it's from the basque people uh and the basque have a legend that they originally came from atlantis which they call atlantica so, uh, you know, keep that in mind. Uh, archaeologists in northern Spain report the discovery of a 2,000-year-old relic in the shape of a hand that is covered in mysterious symbols from an ancient lost language. 
Previous research into the area's Iron Age inhabitants seemed to indicate they were preliterate people without any form of written communication. However, this latest discovery, which they are calling the Hand of Urlegi, Ur Ur I said that right, uh, after the site where it was found, not only refutes that assumption, but may offer clues to the origin of the region's mysterious Basque language, which has no known linguistic relatives. Uh, and they do give us a translation of what it might say. The text inscribed on this artifact, which was found at the entrance of a domestic building, is interpreted as apotropaic, a, a token entreating good fortune. Uh, very interesting. Yeah, that is that is the mysterious hand, uh, the mysterious Basque hand. Um, and uh, it also was recovered from this. This is where it was recovered. Uh, Urulegi. Mm. Okay. Uh, but this site where it was recovered from looks like it was intentionally burned. Intriguing. Uh, and uh, furthermore, um, yeah, the, uh, the researchers also point out that most other pre-Roman languages from the area became extinct under the pressure of Latin, so discovering definitive examples of a pre-Roman uh, Vesconian language is also incredibly valuable. Uh, in this context, the recent discovery at the late Iron Age site uh, uh, yeah, is an important find. Uh, yeah, so they, the researchers can, can see that they may never be able to decipher the mysterious symbols on the hand completely, and its entire purpose and meaning may never be fully understood. Anyway, I just thought that was really interesting. This is a story sent to me by Tim Clark, so thank you so much. I think that's really cool. Uh, this ancient mysterious artifact with this interesting mysterious writing on it uh, from a culture who, uh, whose origin stories, who, whose origin mythology uh, seems to indicate they may be survivors of ancient Atlantis. Meanwhile, here's the letter from the Ministry of Health in Peru uh, talking about the Nazca mummies, right? This is, real, this is really interesting because this is like an official document basically uh, confirming that the Nazca mummies are uh, biological, you know, were biological beings at one point. I mean, this is like UFO disclosure, right? Uh, in a way. Uh, and it, it says, uh, well, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it basically says that, hey guys, we deal with human DNA and this isn't human DNA. Uh, so it's not possible for us to comment on a method methodology that we do not employ in our routine laboratory work since we do not have such bioinformatics tools. So anyway, uh, it's, it, you know, I'll let you read the full uh, letter at your leisure. Uh, but yeah, it's interesting that this is a kind of a backdoor into UFO disclosure. You know, basically admitting these were uh, biological specimens, uh, once living creatures that were not human. And they're saying, hey guys, we don't have the tools or the methodology uh, to work on non-humans. So, you know, we need to find uh, different labs uh, to figure this out. Very interesting. Meanwhile, John Bell has some new UFO videos for us. Uh, you know, he's uh, one of these special people that the phenomenon allows itself uh, to be captured on film by. Uh, they, they seem to want him and others like Chris Bledsoe to get this information out there, uh, again, as a form of UFO disclosure. So let's go over a couple of his newest videos. Wait for it. Wait for it. Look at that. It changes direction. It changes direction. Let's see that again. Look at that. Look at that awesome capture. That is just brilliant. That is just brilliant. That is so cool. Love it. Love it. Here's another one from John uh, where we get some good orb one action. Right here. Look at two. Ooh. There's Big a one. really bright one right here. He's closer. There he is right there. Very bright. Ooh, look at that big one. 
Yeah, you can right see, here they get a different marker. Yeah, yeah, you can see the uh, the little shapes on it, the little texture on it or whatever. Very interesting. Yeah, John comments on it too. So when I hear they get a different marker, and they're bright. It's so much brighter than before there's another one. Very cool stuff. Meanwhile, Ross Coulthard is linking to this article from Salon. Uh, Pentagon report denies UFOs or aliens. Experts accuse the government of misrepresenting the truth. A new report from the Pentagon on UFOs uh, has partially confirmed high-profile whistleblower allegations about planned clandestine government programs for the retrieval and reverse engineering of non-human aircraft via private contractors. The report has also, however, drawn sharp rebuke among academic skeptics and disclosure advocates after raising more questions and concerns than it answered. Concluding the Department of Defense's investigation into itself, <laughs> the report from Arrow claims to have found no empirical evidence of UAP, yet also declassifies the DOD origins and developmental plans for a UAP-related program called Kona Blue that Arrow says never got off the ground. Disclosure advocates have since roundly criticized the report for its alleged lack of scientific rigor and failure to fully disclose first-hand accounts and significant details involving the programs mentioned in the report. The report's critics include famed Pentagon Papers lawyer Dan Sheehan, former ATIP director Lou Elizondo, and the DOD's former top civilian intelligence official, uh, Christopher Mellon. The 63-page report is not only notably laden with typographical errors, misplaced URLs, self-referential self citations, and statements misrepresenting the public conclusions of UAP scholars, but also omits a significant amount of the historically declassified data which the office was tasked with compiling in the report. So there you go, a great article from the Salon uh, blasting uh, Sean Kirkpatrick in the Arrow Report. Meanwhile, this is just cool, guys. Check this out. This is just badass. Oh, my gosh. Nature is beautiful. Look at that. A little freaky, but, man, that is just beautiful. That is just awesome, guys. Love it. Meanwhile, was the Tic Tac a Lockheed Martin ship of some sort? Well, that's what they tried to get Commander David Fravor to believe. So I was talking with Commander Fravor the other day, and um, he shared some information that, that came to him uh, that was just, you know, email style. But George, it was passage material. And I don't know if people on our podcast know what that means, but sometimes in... SAPs or special access programs, they have what they call passage material. It's material that is leaked to people. people. But the thing is, is that this material is being passed around to people like even Commander Fravor, where they're trying to kind of convince him that Lockheed Martin, as an example, had some sort of similar technology to what he saw. First of all, he laughed. He's like, if people knew my job right now, they would know that I know that is not true. So, so it was just he. So yeah, there you go. Uh, they're trying to spread this disinformation, I guess, that Lockheed Martin is responsible for the Tic Tac, and that could be some of what we're seeing now is this disinformation leaking out. Uh, at least that's my take on it. I mean, if you think it's Lockheed Martin, let me know. Uh, but C Commander David Fravor uh, apparently is in a position to know on this. And he says uh, definitively uh, that if you knew what I was doing now, you would know that I know that's not true. Uh, so, yeah, very interesting stuff. Uh, yeah, I don't think that that's a Lockheed Martin ship. Um, but, you know, uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in this possible false narrative that is being spread. Now, what does all of that mean? Uh, are they trying to, uh, you know, divert our attention with the idea of man-made ships? Or are they trying to scapegoat, scapegoat Lockheed Martin? 
uh, but that seems to be uh, kind of the implication that I get, right? Is that the government, good guys, uh, evil private contractors, and we've got to get eminent domain so we can seize this technology from these evil private contractors, right? Really scapegoating Lockheed Martin and the private contractors. Uh, at least that's, you know, an idea that I have. Who knows what the real truth is? They could have been simply trying to debunk uh, that UFO uh, as an anomalous object and pinning it on a more human interest. Uh, but let me know what you think about that and everything else covered today in the comments below. And if you've enjoyed this video, please give me a big thumbs up. I sure would appreciate it. Smash the like button and the bell to be notified of future videos. You don't want to miss a thing. Join me on social media, Facebook and Twitter links below. Love to see you guys there. If you wanted to support Cosmic Road in a bigger way, please consider grabbing a coffee mug or a t-shirt in the merch store below or by becoming a channel member. Channel members are rock stars and I really appreciate you guys support guys thank you also channel members do frequently get to see videos hours ahead of everybody else uh meanwhile of course there are plenty of other videos on the channel and i'll see you guys next time this is jack with cosmic road signing out